So thank you very much, everybody, for coming to uh, the Solidarity Conference. Thank you to our speakers who have donated their time and their knowledge to join us in this uh, small adventure, which has meant collecting various good thinking people from around uh, the world. To the, of course, to the extent that one can do in the few weeks that we had uh, of preparation. So for everybody who is here, there are probably many who could have been here and are not. But let us hope that this initiative will uh, live and that we will have further uh, further editions of it. Uh, so our idea was to have a meeting of people who have thought of the question of intellectual liberty and other liberties in the wake of this crisis. As you know, the crisis has meant that uh, it has been very difficult to have a meaningful conversation on the issues that we usually see discussed in the universities and at, at, uh, at the lectures, uh, various places which for this moment are in most of the world closed. And that's why we have wanted to have this forum of discussion. Uh, the one single question that we have asked all our speakers to think about is the world after the COVID crisis. Now, of course, we should humbly say that the world is not after the COVID crisis as of yet, because uh, many countries are still suffering and even suffering more than two months ago when we started thinking about this conference. So uh, first, let us wish that this crisis be over. Let us wish good health to everybody concerned, to us ourselves. And let us then start this conference. Uh, let me say uh, a few words about our first two speakers. They are Florian Geiber and Igor Stix. Uh, they are actually going to give us a presentation in two times. That is, they have been uh, already thinking of these questions quite early on, and they made an interview in March, uh, which is available on YouTube and which we are going to look at. And then after that, we're going to have a discussion to see how their thoughts have evol evolved from that time. I'm of course uh, quite humbled to speak here before them because they are both specialists and especially Florian is somebody who uh, is a great specialist on what is now called the Western Balkans, which I guess in my time was called Yugoslavia. Uh, so uh, it is, I think, quite impressive that somebody who is not at all from that region has uh, over the years collected so much knowledge and deep insight into what is happening there. Uh, so you have seen all the accolades that uh, Florian's CV uh, has. He's uh, at the University of Graz. He's a chair of, a, he has a prestigious chair. He uh, runs, uh, he's uh, in the advisory body for the Western Balkans and so forth. So. Uh, he is a very impressive speaker to have. And so is Igor Stix. Igor is somebody who comes from my own hometown, Sarajevo, and who has uh, lived in many parts of the euphemistically called region. So he has lived, of, obviously, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He has lived also in Croatia. He now lives in Belgrade. And he has lived also in other countries in Europe including France, where, where I'm broadcasting from. And uh, he has had much recognition for his work. He is um, also a writer. He got uh, awards for his writing. Uh, and he also uh, is a Chevalier des Arts et Lettres here in France. So this is a uh, very impressive. Uh, it's very, I'm very pleased that somebody from uh, you know, my own town, from my own culture, has achieved so much. So I am really very, very pleased to have them both here. Welcome both Florian and Igor. Thank you. Thank you, Mirna, for, for inviting us to, to this uh, very interesting, unusual, and that's, that's a good part in a good sense of word, <laughs> conference. Uh, 
Thanks. Thanks. Thank also. you, Igor. Thank you very much, Florian. So now I'll try to share my screen uh, where I have prepared uh, the YouTube link with your video and we'll all together watch this video. Uh, there is no sound. Ah, okay. Wait. There is no sound. Sorry, then I, I should probably take off my uh, speak, uh, my headphones. Right. And the Maybe sound. something. So, uh, welcome you? to our uh, second uh, yes. COVID-19 Western Balkans Dialogue. I'm very glad to be talking to Igor Stix today, who is a writer and a social scientist and political activist, uh, and who's uh, joining me from Belgium. Mm. Again, there is a problem with sound again, uh, Mirna. Yeah, maybe you should keep it. Don't uh, turn off your mic, Mirna, and um, what try, should try I do? Again. And should make try. it louder. Try to make it louder. Yeah. Uh huh. Restart okay. it. Yeah. Okay. I took off my uh, speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, welcome to our uh, second uh, COVID-19 dialogue. I'm very glad to be talking to Igor Stix today, who is a writer and a social scientist and political activist, uh, and who's uh, joining me from Belgrade. Uh, and, and what we want to talk about uh, is a little bit about kind of state-society relations, what the, the crisis and the government response means, what the kind of what it tells us about society about the countries and i guess one thing you also brought up which we'll talk about is uh is this the end of the post-socialist era uh or not or had it did it end already 10 years ago or so in a certain way how important is this moment really uh or is it just kind of shining a light on what has been going on for a longer period of time but maybe we'll start with uh, Igor. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you see the role of you know kind of the state, what does the state look like in these moments of crisis? Mm. Uh, well, obviously it, it depends where, where we are or where we happen to be when the, when the pandemic uh, hit us. Uh, um, uh, it, it's, now I'm speaking from Belgrade, so clearly at the European periphery in a peripheral state that's been weakened over the last uh, 30 years. And that of course people still um, believe in it is still institutions are there people need some authority some guidelines and we could see that that uh, on on one hand uh, the the state is, is 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 quite weak it cannot really respond as actively uh, as it should uh, that the resources are, are almost empty especially in the in the periphery where there's some some uh, um, essential it items been missing uh, or, or or so basically the state stopped producing them. Oh, 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 oh. So, so on one hand, we, we see this, and on the other, we see how important any kind of authority is in, the, in this situation. So, so uh, it depends really that how you manage this kind of pandemic in this situation depends on people in power. And this is why we faced uh, different scenarios uh, in Slovenia, in Croatia, or in Bosnia and, and Serbia. So who is, where is the place of authority? People ask themselves, and uh, uh, can I trust these people? So this is, uh, it seems that in Croatia, they managed to do it slightly better than in Serbia, where the management of the crisis, especially from the beginning and, and even at, until today, has been um, 
has been quite uh, chaotic, and also the messages that have been, that, that been sent from, from the top uh, has been quite contradictory. So we got um, uh, ju ju just one example of how, how the authority is important is that, that people do respond to what the state says. Say, okay, now don't go out, don't do this or do, don't do that. Now, it's another question if someone constantly comes to TV and tells you it's your responsibility. Actually, I didn't do anything wrong. It's actually you, but that's an, another issue. Uh, but for instance, uh, uh, already uh, two days ago, uh, they basically announced after four-day total lockdown uh, that they're going to ease the, 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 the regime and already people are, people are out. So they got the signal both times. So it's, it seems that people really want to trust trust the authority still, whoever is, is in power, but the problem is how you manage this relationship of, of confidence. So is it, is it, I mean, it strikes me as an, uh, an observer from a distance that there's a lot, that this relationship, especially in Serbia, is one of very much, as you said, authoritarian in a certain way. I mean, beyond the nature of the regime, but just that it's communicated in terms of orders, in terms of what people should or should not do, but it's not very well explained, and that in a certain way, it's, it's reflecting kind of the state doesn't trust its own citizens. I mean, this is kind of the, if you hear what you also alluded to, is the way in which the, uh, you know, the, the citizens are kind of scolded like little children in a certain way for not behaving properly. So it fe one feels like a very, you know, kind of paternalistic in a certain way uh, state. Is, is that also your perception? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's, you know, we, we know that they, there used to be states that um, could be authoritarian or paternalistic, but that you can somehow trust. And now you have people who became, behave paternalistically, but completely changing their policies from one day to, to, to the next, uh, uh, being, being horribly irresponsibly, irresponsibly in, in this respect, and then accusing others to behave irresponsibly. So this is not the way uh, uh, really, to to go through the, through this crisis, and certainly, I hope I hope that uh, that in better times we're going to have a, a bit of discussion about it. I mean, there is a lot of discussion uh, about what what is going on, but it's still we still live under the state of uh, of emergency, and therefore that does not open up uh, a much much space really for a, for a, some kind of a, a democratic dialogue. Uh, uh, the problem will be if uh, that. that that, that maybe we should we should think in different categories. Well, there are states that are usually recognized, or they are called the republic or the kingdom of or whatever. But actually, we we deal with some kind of regimes, yeah. and in some kind of administrations that are trying to figure out how to to manage society. Very often influenced by 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 private interest, and political, economical, criminal. Uh, and uh, that there is, uh, in, in this respect, we, 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 we cannot really count on the state to be there and to really do these elementary functions. Uh, and I think that people lost, lost really uh, trust in that. Now, of course, the question is why they still believe in, uh, if they lost trust in real institutions, uh, so that it means that they have a, a, a real sense of what is going on, why many of them still trust in, in myths? and stories, uh, especially national myths and nationalist uh, stories and imagination, uh, the why every time you bring, bring back the national question, the question of survival of your nation, of borders, of territories, why you manage to silence, silence everybody. So it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a tricky, tricky one to, to really understand and to grasp this. I mean, isn't it maybe also that exactly because the state is weak and people might not might be suspicious of it that in fact these stories even become more important because you can't the institutions don't provide you with something to believe in. So what else do you believe in, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what is the other ideas or the other concepts you could you yeah. could invest yourself into? So mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I'm wondering, you know, do you, do you see this crisis then as an accelerator of something which has been going on, you know, before or? or uh, does it, you know, make it something visible? Or how do you, you know, and uh, how do you see? I mean, you said you, you know, you hope or you, you, you believe that there needs to be a conversation afterwards. Do you see there being that there will be a space even for having this kind of conversation afterwards? So, or how would it look like? 
Uh, yeah, it's it's it, 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 it's hard to it's hard to tell. What we could certainly see the, is that there there will be consequences of this situation. Some clearly are global, some are local, uh, uh, but people are going to ask questions and know what happened and why what thing happened in that way and not the, the other way. And of course, they're going to, to look for um, for someone to blame, and this will be rightly so. The government, people in power. And uh, uh, I think that many things that we could see the governments, uh, not only in Serbia, but in the region, are doing is kind of to pre try, trying preemptively to, to divert the attention towards other, other subjects and also to say we did everything actually citizens did not respect or international community did not help us or, or it's, it's, it's not something we created, we actually bravely fought through this war, as they call, call, call it very often, and, and therefore uh, we should now win the next election, so therefore we should be trusted. Now the question is, of course, uh, are people going to believe it, or are they going to say, look, okay, now pandemic is over, now we are facing the reality of total social and economic crisis, uh, we can't, we are frustrated and we can't wait for, for the change any longer. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure what's, what, what's going to really happen, but that there will be a lot of frustration and anger. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's certainly true. The, the question whether there will be channels to express this anger. So do you have political channels to express it? Elections, streets, squares, demonstrations, conflicts. Uh, 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 what not, uh, and, and when the, when, how we are going to actually go through this year. Um, um, so so this, will, this will be a challenge in the, in the certainly in the Balkans in 2020. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how can you, I mean, because you've been also, you know, you're following, you know, kind of, you, you've been an activist yourself, you're following a kind of activist movement, so how do you see even, uh, you know, what are the kind of venues of, of articulating um, grievances and also can they be um, transnational? Because, I mean, again, I mean, the, what we're talking about, the, the weakness of states, the states which have been, you know, depleted in many ways um, for the last 20, 30 years through multiple crises. I mean, you know, people have been joking that for millennials, this is the second crisis, while people are from, you know, have said from, you know, from the post yugoslav space, well, you know, spare me. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know, the X, the, the 10th crisis uh, since uh, for 30 years. I mean, tell me the years when things were quote unquote normal. Uh, um, so in that sense, these are all very similar, whether, I mean, the response might be different now in Croatia and Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but, you know, the kind of fundamental structural uh, bases are similar, right? So, mm -hmm. so what kind of space is there for, uh, you know, kind of finding a language or finding a way to, to talk about this and to organize um, across the region, maybe, or, or learn from each other? What are the ways to even articulate uh, mm -hmm. this uh, at the moment or in the, in the coming the coming months or year well uh, over over last 10 years what we could certainly say that there, there's been a lot of activism a lot of social movements so that the society did respond to the 2008 crisis that opened up many possibilities at least discussion what kind of system do we do we want what kind of society we live in what kind of democracy we want all these basic questions that has been asked elsewhere and luckily these movements did happen of course, there was a bit of disappointment because this movement couldn't really solve the structural problems of these societies, uh, nor they could actually take power uh, just, just like that. Uh, they really were uh, true uh, social movements without, uh, without much, uh, uh, many attempts to actually enter into the institutions apart from Slovenia and also partially Croatia. So certainly there will be this idea that now we, uh, you, you can't change things just, just by, by protest movements or by occupying certain buildings where you have to go into the institutions. And there, there, there will be, there we're going to see, in spite of all similarities, a lot of differences. Why it was possible to, to do uh, more, um, uh, more uh, active, actually enter into more active politics and influence it in Slovenia rather than in Croatia, let alone Serbia or, or Bosnia. There, these local differences will, will play out very well. We could expect uh, uh, that in Zagreb there will be a movement, there is already a movement actually uh, to contest 
the current mayor and, and, and his rule there, uh, we could expect that some space might open up for those who will, uh, who will actually switch the, 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 the public uh, um, attention towards social issues that are becoming more and more prominent. They've been prominent already, but now they will be certainly very, very prominent. Uh, uh, what, what, you can, can, what can you do in Bosnia? This was the, always the question we ask ourselves because you have a peace agreement and you have a very small space to actually express a different way of understanding politics, a um, situation that in a way is similar to, to, to Lebanon where we witnessed a, an extraordinary civic movement that's been stopped by this pandemic, but that might resume. And, and in Serbia, clearly uh, things are very uh, polarizing and, and also it seems that there is one regime and there is one person on, on top of this regime uh, so that things might be either him or, or us. And so it means that, 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 that uh, some more sophisticated social movements with, uh, with, with fine understanding of socioeconomic issues might be forced actually to join hands with people that you don't want joining hands or even shaking hands with <laughs> in order to, to make some change. Kind of. Well, at least at the moment, you don't have to shake hands with anybody. So <laughs> that, makes exactly. things, that makes things easier. Um, but you were, you were also pointing out saying, you know, is this, uh, you know, people have all talked about, you know, the post-socialist period, you know, um, what is, you know, the, the, the era after 1990, you know, for the post Yugoslav space, 91, you know, the post Yugoslav space. And, you know, so, to some degree, it seemed like 2008 was a turning point in many ways, a point when the belief that the kind of uh, simple pattern of emulation, neoliberal economy would not deliver um, for the region and, you know, more, more globally. But, uh, you know, to some degree, nothing changed fundamentally in terms of the structures afterwards. Is this going to be another turning point? Are we entering, you know, a, a, an era which we will call like the post-pandemic Balkan era, or, uh, uh, or or how, or, or is it is it just uh, you know an event um, which, at the end, will not be marking you know not be marking a before and after in the same way? What is your your take? Of course, I mean, you know, we all know that in the middle of it, it's impossible to make proper prediction, but it's kind of just sensing of, of where, where we're at at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you you, uh, um, uh, you 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 said it. Two thousand and eight was was a, a first kind of um, opening, and uh, uh, but the the real change did not come. The only thing that 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 uh, uh, that happened is that we uh, stop uh, dealing with this region as as kind of transitional region, so the transition <laughs> was dropped from the vocabulary. It was clear where we, are, we don't know where we are transiting. It's not the ideas we had in, back in the early 90s. And then we started using post-socialism a, a lot because we couldn't find really the, the, the right word for it. You say neoliberalism, it's too general. And post-socialism somehow brought us back to socialism. So over the last 10 years, we questioned not only the what happened after so, uh, after socialism, but also what was happening during socialism, and that brought in a lot of interesting intellectual and, and political debates, and somehow rehabilitated also certain ideas, especially about social justice, uh, that became quite 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 important quite important for many social social actors. Uh, um, uh, on one hand, if this is not uh, the end of that period, so thirty years, although some who could say 40 years uh, after the death of Tito, maybe this is like, it's, it will happen in a couple of days, so it's, we're going to test whether it's like a biblical thing of 40 years of, of uh, wandering in, in the desert, uh, uh, and, and who going to take us out and where, this is, this is a big question mark. But of course, we, uh, if nothing happens, then it, it means it's going to be even worse, so the, 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 the worst forms of, uh, that we saw in post-socialism, such as uh, neoliberal model in peripheral countries. It, it has a specific perverse twist here in, this, in these peripheral regions, uh, coupled with, with, uh, um, with new kind of uh, new energy for nationalism. So that would be the, the, really the worst outcome.
Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's time to change this post-conflict region is to post-pandemic, uh, as you suggested. That would be at least a change of, of vocabulary. I somehow think that we're going to count this, especially because of what, is ha what, my, what will happen and what is coming, and uh, which will be uh, uh, horrible global consequences of this pandemic, as uh, an important milestone. And this will, of course, bring us back to, to re-examining our, our position. Uh, the recent past, last 30 years, but also the, the, the past from the 20th century, uh, it, it, it might, in, in the best case scenario, open up a, 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 a new kind of uh, take or, uh, on what is going on and, and where we might go uh, uh, from here. As we know, we've been lacking in this narrative, apart from nationalistic narrative that is not going into the future, mostly towards the past, and, and, and it doesn't open any, anything, apart from giving a sense of identity and, uh, and a sense of uh, being for, 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 for many people, we don't have an alternative narrative, really, that will open up uh, uh, kind of a, a future path to, so that we could at least envisage or uh, 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 the, the, uh, a different type of Balkans in the in the in the in the in the twenties of the twenty first century or in the thirties or ahead of us, and then somehow manage to to change a political vocabulary. I mean, certainly one thing which seems clear is that the, the role of the state has returned, right? Because, I mean, to some degree, the idea that you can privatize everything and that, uh, you know, kind of the market will take care of it has been proven to be, at least in moments of crisis, a flaw because, you know, you need a state which uh, enforces rules. You need a state which has health care because it's not private health care, but it's public health care. So in that sense, maybe uh, what we're seeing is certainly um, the significance of a functioning, a functioning state, not a, not a night watchman state, but a functioning state, which has become at least visible as, as being beneficial. And I think we're also seeing that states which, are, which have kept a lot of these fun functions of the state have been doing a lot better uh, in dealing with the crisis than the states which have had to uh, uh, scale down uh, their capacities, right? So this really, way, I would say one of, the, one of the lessons seems to be that functional, you know, functional states which have not given up too many powers to non-state actors seem to be better prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, and 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 also also I think there will be a lot of pressure to have this type of functional state uh, with uh, elements of um, kind of uh, uh, with elements of welfare state, uh, the state that will invest into into public health, into into social care, uh, um, um, ideas that were deemed impossible uh, just a month ago are back on the table, such as basic income, for instance, and how to deal with this type of uh, crisis in order to save society. And uh, so it's true that there is an ideological shift towards people and less profit, so that profit cannot, private profit cannot really guarantee the happiness of all or the happiness of majority. Uh, and, and there will be a pressure, pressure uh, to, to do this. The problem is that people can, could, of course, um, pervert this idea and say exactly we need the state, we need the, we need the army, we need to protect borders, and, and so on. And this is what I think is going to happen in peripheral society, this new kind of idea that, uh, of, of um, this new operetta of sovereignism of actually acting as if you are important, of acting as if you were a, a power that the, uh, 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 the best case scenario will be that within societies people say, okay, well, we know what we want, we know what, want to live um, a better life and also to have, uh, but on the other hand, we, we know that we are too small, so we have to see what's happening in, in our region, we have to go and talk to the neighbors, without neighbors we cannot really protect resources and uh, natural resources infrastructure and so on so we have to find a new way actually of being in this world that won't be as uh, 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 egoistic or or uh, xenophobic and nationalistic as it was before so that would be the best case scenario of course the worst case scenario you know good well thanks you basically given us two options <laughs> that's always uh, <laughs> it's always good and i think it's good to, to think about that but let me last question because i think uh, in, we all live in extraordinary um, circumstances at the moment you know you you are uh, you are also besides being an analyst and uh, an academic you're also a writer and 
uh, as a writer, like, tell me how do you, how is it like you know how is it like you know you just published a novel not long ago. You probably have a lot of uh, readings cancelled. What is it like you know living at the moment uh, for you? I mean, what does it mean mm -hmm. you know li living as a writer as a, as an intellectual in these circumstances mm -hmm. in a place like Belgrade? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, true, of course. We 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 all made plans, and uh, and then there was a lot of readings, and then the the the. the the book is out, and also, also, also some travels and tours, and uh, the, everything's been cancelled. Actually, what is called normal literary life that you can go into a bookstore and buy my book, it's not, it's not, it's not been possible. Uh, it will open up, so people turn towards online, but it's a different, a different model, and it doesn't work in the same way. We know that there will be problems. That in the crisis, people usually do not buy books. <laughs> they go to hopefully to libraries, or they they actually turn into their own bookshelves and see what to read there so in this respect um, it, it, it's going to be a, a classical thing of, of a writer coming from some kind of peripheral country but also true in the, in the, in the big big languages uh, that you can't live off your writing you cannot expect that actually art will bring you or creative work will bring you uh, uh, enough revenue uh, uh, which means you have to do, do other things, academic work, or <laughs> work in a bar or something like that, which all comes uh, uh, to, to, to the same, which means that the, the time you want to dedicate for, for your, to your art, you can't actually do it because you have to do other things. But of course, we know that many, many good stories uh, come out of this, and there will be a many, many good stories coming from, 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 from this crisis. Uh, uh, let's hope we'll be, we'll be able to tell them, and also that, that they, they'll turn out good <laughs> uh, eventually, and that, that in a way, uh, we're going to meet readers again. You never know who, who reads, who, uh, books travel in, in, in extraordinary ways. But well, I think you know this is maybe a, a helpful note to, to end on, Igor, because it's uh, making us think about the future of the day when we go and pick up books in the bookshop again and browse and uh, discuss them over a nice glass of wine or a cup of coffee. Um, so thanks for for joining me today and sharing your thoughts. Uh, th thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And of course, uh, good good luck with with everything. Stay safe and healthy. Well, that was something. Thank you very much. Beginning to set up with the microphone, and I hope now we all hear each other. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I would like to lead some discussion, and of course, let me first explain why it is me leading this discussion rather than, for example, Florian, who has so much experience. It is because uh, I would like to hear both of your opinions. So I would like to ask you both some questions that are brought up by uh, your excellent presentation. Uh, well, so obviously now we are past that 4th of May, past the 40 years. Uh, has anything changed, Igor? Uh, yeah, but maybe for our friends coming from, from various parts of the world, uh, it's been, uh, yeah, for, uh, uh, as I said, 40 years of crisis, uh, certainly uh, that somehow could, the death of, uh, of Tito could be seen as the beginning of the, of the Yugoslav crisis that's been just rolling on and on uh, for already 40 years with, with many, many, many twists and of course many tragic uh, events that, that, that happened. Um, it is a coincidence. Now it's it's interesting to some, sometimes to 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 think through these coincidences and to see. Uh, basically, we can respond to the question that that uh, Florian and I discussed: Are we really witnessing a change, and um, and uh, or the things are going to de de deteriorate even further? So uh, um, there's not much space for optimism, although although we we might try through throughout this discussion actually to uh, to find some ground for for optimism. Yeah, what do you think, Florian? Yeah, I think I mean this is really I think when when Igor and I were talking, and it's of course terrible to watch your the videos of your own conversations uh, again. Um, <laughs> it's it certainly was a moment when there was. You know, it was very unpredictable how things would develop, um, and, and of course, we still are. We don't have great clarity, and I think um, 
you know, of course, the pandemic is far from over today. It was said it was one of the worst days in terms of infections, and it's become more global in many ways than it was two months ago when we talked to Igor and I. Um, so I think the consequences are hard to tell, but I, th I certainly feel like the conversations which were had in the beginning about, you know, pre pre you know a creative response like global, uh, like uh, universal income or, or other measures which would be, you know, possible seem maybe less possible now than they seemed two months ago. In a certain way, the kind of uh, idea, space for ideas has, sh has shrunken, I would say, to some degree, um, because everybody is this, this return to normality. I mean, this is this discourse, you know, or the new normality is so pervasive that there is no space to say, well, what, is the pro what was the problem beyond the disease? Um, of course, you could say the one big thing, which is certainly Black Lives Matter's movement, uh, which has become a global movement in many ways, is also a product of, of, of COVID-19. It's not only one of them, of course. It has historical roots going much further back. It's got uh, triggers by the, triggered by the Trump presidency of uh, you know, institutionalized uh, propagation of racism by the highest uh, office holder in the country. Um, but it resonates, of course, on all kinds of levels of racism and uh, exclusion in Europe as well. But I think it's if people weren't locked up, and also if in America, but also in Britain and elsewhere, one didn't see that um, blacks and other minorities suffered more than 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 others from the disease. I think all of that made it made this whole movement more resonated. So another killing of a, of a by a cop would have been ignored uh, potentially if it weren't for this environment. So that sense. Um, well, I'm kind of a pessimistic about the state response, I would say there's some social movement which has come out of that. I mean, something which Igor and I were talking about back then, we had no idea what we were thinking about, but that there's a social movement which is quite global, I'm not in Southeastern Europe, but one which is otherwise global, which tackles um, uh, questions of racism is certainly something which, which I think has been, is also a product of the, disease, of the, the pandemic. Yes, uh, well, you are totally right. And in fact, uh, during this conference, we will read a, a story that Vedra Narudan made uh, in March. And it is interesting that already at that point, she's talking about racism. And I totally agree with you that uh, COVID-19 uh, and the Black Lives Matter revival are, are connected. Uh, well, let us maybe go back one more time to the Balkans. Uh, Igor, you mentioned something about Bosnia, which uh, I found very interesting. Uh, you said that maybe there the space for movement is restrained by the by this peace agreement from 1996, but still maybe there is something that can be done like the people are doing in Lebanon. Have you had a feeling by talking to the people in Bosnia that this COVID-19 pandemic, which for once is not differentiating between uh, the ethnic groups, yeah. uh, does this actually have some influence on the local politics, you think? Well, in a limited way, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's still ongoing, so uh, it's difficult to really um, to really get to the point that maybe I overall optimistically uh, announced, uh, thinking that all this rage and frustration will have to find uh, a way to of expression. And uh, we don't know, uh, people in power usually have various mechanisms to somehow control these, these things and they use them, they use them at the everyday level. And to mount a social movement is very difficult, unless something explosive happened like in 2014 in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina or like in, in Lebanon, uh, where I think uh, the, the, the courage shown by protesters um, to, 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 to imagine a different Lebanon uh, is really exemplary. Uh, and we can only hope for that. But also, of course, we know that we are in the environment that is, um, that is dominated by the various interests and the various interests of, of of people who uh, basically we call them, you know, et ethnic entrepreneurs who, who, who thrive on, on, on a peace agreement. So if you want to unravel a peace agreement, then you have, have a lot of troubles and people would rather have a bad peace or uh, then, then to unravel peace or to, to put peace in, in question. So uh, yes, sometimes we have very inspiring events coming from, uh, from a difficult places. As I mentioned, the, the something that makes me 
um, optimistic is the fact that there are so many social movements around uh, and that people see that there are different ways of imagining politics, but eventually uh, some change ha uh, has to happen. And unfortunately, it usually means changing institutions. And there, there we, we all hit uh, the, the wall. Uh, and this is, this is why, why this, this, this post-pandemic era uh, will be very, very difficult and, and, and unpredictable. And as we mentioned, I just hope that we are just not going back to the, all the recipes of uh, enmity, of hatred, of basically uh, closing borders uh, to, to use the virus as, as something that will enhance a, a nationalistic narrative rather than opening up rather than understanding that you can win over this situation only if actually if you, if you open up for regional and wider international cooperation. Indeed. Well, this is a turning point and thank you for this analysis. Florian, you uh, probably have thoughts on this subject as well and also from the point of view who, uh, of somebody who is actually in the advisory committee for, for the Western Balkans uh, what influence do you have on what's happening? Can it, is there any influence one can imagine on the politics there? And uh, what is your opinion? I mean, I, 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 share, I share Igor's view. I mean, I think the real challenge is, first of all, that people feel like they're, that change is possible in the country. And I think this is the big, um, unlike in Lebanon, Bosnians uh, can leave the country easily. Um, and this is what's been going on, of course, that people who want to imagine a better life and a better democratic, accountable living environment leave. Um, and they go to Austria, they go to Germany, they go to Sweden, and it's easy and it's possible. And it's on an individual level, it's a choice I respect and I, I, I would probably do very, something very similar if I were in that position. But of course, as a social phenomena, it's disastrous because um, the energy for change becomes an energy for personal change, but not for collective improvement of the society. And that's, again, it's, it's, it's a logical reaction because people have been so frustrated with um, the inability to change the system. And I don't see, I mean, I think as Igor says, like it's a shock which requires people to, but it's a shock to get people out and it requires the sense that they can change that um, to actually work on changing the Bosnian system. And I think it works in many ways all throughout the region. I mean, that people go to the streets and also take a, take a risk um, only when they feel like that risk might pay off for them in terms of getting a better system. I mean, you have to keep in mind, I mean, people are tied to their governments through bounds of clientelism. I mean, they risk their jobs or their parents' jobs or their uncles' jobs if they speak up against the government. They risk police fines. They risk uh, all kinds of subtle and not so subtle repressive measures. So going to the streets and protesting for, for a better life and a different type of politics is not a risk-free enterprise. And I think the critical mass which is needed to really lead to any change is something which only will work when people feel, first of all, frustrated enough that they see no choice, but also that they don't worry about the consequences of really pushing for change. And then the real question in, in a place like Bosnia, unlike it's more difficult than in Serbia in many ways, in Serbia it's one man, uh, the problem. Uh, it's a system based on a single person. In Bosnia, it's never one man or uh, one person. And I say one man because it is men really who are dominating this. Um, uh, but um, but it's, it's, uh, in Bosnia, it's always at least three um, and even more. So it's much harder to tackle it in a multinational environment, which is so divided and politically represented by different communities and their political parties, which requires a certain concerted effort in a certain way. To change Bosnia, three elites have to be tackled at the same time, which are interwoven elites in Serbia and Montenegro, uh, elsewhere in the Western Balkans uh, or former Yugoslavia. It has to be, it's usually one, it's one party, one leader. Um, and that's easier to some degree than, than a system which is much more complicated and diffuse. I mean, this is the paradox. I mean, Igor brought up Lebanon and I've looked at Lebanon many ways times compared to Bosnia. And, you know, Lebanon has been more democratic than its neighbors, not because citizens are more democratic, but because there has been more centers of power uh, and that makes it more democratic, but also harder to change, much harder to change. 
uh, and this is the same in Bosnia, that it's more pluralistic, but it's a pluralism which is also very destructive and much harder to actually transform. And I think this is why, why this has been so difficult in, in, in Bosnia, uh, unlike its neighboring countries. Indeed. Uh, I would like to give a few minutes of an occasion to the audience to ask questions. Would anybody uh, around have a question to ask of Igor and Florian? You can turn on your microphone if you want to ask a question. Go ahead. Well, uh, in that case, perhaps uh, I will just thank you very much for this think, fantastic. I think, I think uh, there's a question by Esma. Oh, Esma, right. Esma wants oh to say, yes, I was wondering how come Esma doesn't want to ask a question because when I told her that you are going to be here, she said, Florian Viber, I was reading his books when I was a student. <laughs> So, Esma, please. <laughs> I, I still read reading it, in fact. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to, to have you here and can join you. Uh, when you was, were talking about this space, Bosnia, Lebanon, the social revolts, um, for me as a journalist, uh, a very interesting space is the Mediterranean. Because I think we are finding in this small place or small scenario, um, very different uh, issues right now, all the new forces uh, fighting, uh, taking part, and especially in this pandemic, taking part, and uh, also uh, social revolts that are trying to, to do its best to change things. And uh, a very interesting issue is that inequality is the, for me, the key question in this pandemic and in this new Post war, uh, post war. I'm sorry, I want to say post uh, post COVID, but in fact, it's similar, uh, like a post war situation that we will be, we will find in in this scenario. So I would like to to ask you if we put some context in this uh, huge pandemic that is global, but maybe in a space like Mediterranean, we can find it in a in a table. Hmm. I, mean, I think it's an interesting question to look at the, re the region in the kind of Mediterranean uh, context. And, um, you know, I, I, certain, I certainly think that they, they, are, they are communicating vessels. I mean, many of the protest movements which happened in the last decade were Mediterranean protest movements, you know, from Taksim to, uh, to, to Spain, um, to also, the, also, also uh, North Africa. So in a certain way, I found it always striking looking back, especially at the first five years of the, the teens, uh, how the protest movements, you know, were crossing the Mediterranean and crossing also to the, to the Western Balkans. Um, some of them, of course, had very different causes. Some were against dictatorships and some happened in political democracies. Um, some of them had very unequal societies, um, like, like, like Egypt in one way, or, but also some democracies or you know, measures against austerity, like in Greece. In the Western Balkans, I think a lot of them were less about inequality, although inequality was an important, is an important point. But I think a lot of them were about the loss of the public space or the public sphere. Um, and I think this is something which, uh, we had a conference in Graz a few years ago on this, and we kind of looked at the, what do we call, you know, the tragedy of the commons and how basically the privatization, but also the authoritarianism has been eroding public space, taking away, whether it's destroying parks, uh, trees, building shopping centers, which are private spaces, not public spaces, basically allowing people no longer to meet in, 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 in a public uh, space, which is not controlled by either authoritarian or commercial or both. And I think this is maybe the one unifying parenthesis of all of them is that the levels of inequality are different, the political systems are different, even the economic structures are different. But what they all had in common, what they all were triggered by was the loss of public space. Um, and I think this is again, one of the things which of course, the, the pandemic has been, you know, it's been the classic destroyer of public space, right? Because public spaces were closed, parks were closed, public meeting places were closed. And the only space we had left um, was um, our, computer screens, um, which of course is a, is a very private and not entirely public space, or it's an odd mixture of both. Um, so I'm wondering if like that sense of deprivation of, pro of public spaces, which 
I think never before have so many people around the world, uh, including in liberal democracies, have experienced this loss, um, that, that this is really shaping their experiences. And I'm kind of really interested to see how people afterwards will re reoccupy the space or whether uh, how this will be become an issue of politics, uh, the space and how to reclaim it. Okay, uh, so I, I, can I just suggest something and then I will let Igor also uh, answer mm -hmm. a little bit. And then we have actually quite a lot of questions, which I think will make a very nice conversation, uh, which I don't want to have uh, in two minutes. And uh, we are running late for Uganda's talk. So if I could suggest, since we have a break after Uganda's talk, that we now hear Igor's answer to asthma. And then uh, after we have listened to Yogendra, we will talk, talk about his talk and then we can come back to the questions that have risen here. Uh, I guess I need to learn from Florian how to uh, really time these things. So forgive me that uh, the timing maybe wasn't very perfect, but I hope you can deal with it. Yeah, and now maybe, Igor, maybe can just, you- Maybe just two minutes yes. for the question that came in the comments from Anaxi. Uh, um, and uh, because I think Florian uh, re responded to Esma's que question very, very well, uh, and when asks what, what is the game changer, why this is a, a, such a huge game changer, and um, one answer could yeah, be... Igor, that, sorry, could you just repeat the question she asked, because maybe not everybody right. is reading the chat. Yes. Uh, so this is what she has. Uh, he, for um, as far as far as I understand the situation, uh, the COVID crisis has not been too tough in the countries of the Western Balkans. What then makes this pandemic a game changer for these countries? Yeah, so the pandemic was not absolutely devastating like in Italy or, or in Spain. This is true, but what what happened? It was this state of emergency and also the closure for 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 for. for, for for some month or month and a half. Uh, and also, but I would say why it's a game changer. So the financial crisis in 2008 showed us that the model of post-socialist uh, transition, and this is something Florian and I discussed in our talk, um, is flawed and might not function. But as we know that, uh, that you know, maybe some of the neoliberal ideas are put in question, but the machine continue working on. And this, this is also the case in the post-socialist Balkans. Now, this time it's clear that people started asking questions about public health, about, uh, some kind, about social justice in face of losing jobs in face of the crisis that is coming. Uh, uh, what is the role of the state? In a way, uh, the, the space opened up for this fundamental discussion, what kind of society we, we want to have. And also because clearly to, to, to stop everything uh, for, for such a long, uh, such a period of time within a global crisis seems to be uh, a milestone, seems to be a crucial milestone, uh, maybe similar, probably similar to, the, to what was the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, Maybe we are wrong. Maybe um, there will be a lot of pros forces that will try to get things back to the normal, of course, or, or what happened before the pandemic. Uh, but I think we, we will definitely need to, need to discuss these issues within the new context. And therefore, maybe a new period starts. For now, we have one suggestion, which is Florian's suggestion, which is post-pandemic Balkans. I like it so far. We'll see if it, it will stick. <laughs> Yes, well, finally, the time for us to move from the post-war to post something else. And uh, well, at least that is somewhat uh, optimistic. I would really like to thank you for your wonderful talk, for your very interesting conversation, for the, to the audience, uh, for the very interesting questions.